Welcome, welcome. Well, today I am going to be covering another suitcase murder. And this one involves a woman named Melanie. Her maiden name was Slate McGuire. And she was described as a very loving, considerate, compassionate woman. She was beautiful, smart. She got a double major in math and psychology at Rutgers University. And then she went and got her nursing degree at Charles W. Gregory Nursing School. In 1999, she did work as a fertility nurse at the Reproductive Medicine Associate. And she was very, very skilled and she was loved by her patients. That same year, she did get married to her husband, Bill, and they met when both of them were working in a restaurant together. Now, Bill was a U.S. Navy veteran, and he went on to work as a computer programmer at the uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Bill was said to be very charismatic, had a great sense of humor, and him and Melanie just really did have this, this banter uh, where they were very, very good together. They gave as good as they got, and they both were very, very smart and very witty. In 2020, they had their first son, and they lived in Woodbridge Township, New Jersey, and they had rented a, a townhouse there. Now, Melanie did end up having a little secret. Uh, when she was 30 weeks pregnant with her second son, she did end up starting it, having an affair with a man, uh, Brad Miller, a doctor that she had worked with, and uh, he was also married. Melanie described her marriage to Bill as it could be, you know, tumultuous at times. He even threatened her, and uh, he also had a gambling problem, which really did add a lot of stress to the relationship. So when Melanie was 31 years old and Bill was 39, they decided to put a down payment on, on a house. And even though the marriage really wasn't going that great, Melanie thought that if they put money into the house, then at least he wouldn't be able to, to gamble it away. And when Brad had heard about this, you know, he really did have mixed feelings because, you know, here they're going and buying a house together, doing something very, very permanent. And he really did want to be with Melanie. And she reassured him that they had been drinking wine, her and Bill. He had, you know, fallen asleep on the couch. But as soon as he woke up, she was going to ask him for a divorce. Now, her and Bill did, in fact, end up getting into a big fight. And it was between 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. So Bill really wanted to buy a house in Virginia that would have been quite a bit cheaper. But Melanie wanted to stay in New Jersey. And so he had resentment there. He felt like he was settling for this house. Um, and so they, they ended up fighting. He apparently pinned her to to the wall, um, slapped her, and even shoved a, a dryer sheet in, in her mouth. And at that point, she saw her two-year-old son, and she grabbed him and locked her and the baby into the bathroom. And she said that she could hear Bill, you know, yelling and, and saying he's leaving and, and you, you know, she could tell the children why, why they don't have a father and he left. She believed that he was just going to go to Atlantic city and that he would eventually be back, but he never came back. Um, it was about a month and still no, no bill. And she never filed a missing persons report. Um, as a matter of fact, the very next day she did go to see a divorce attorney and she, she claimed that she never reached out to Bill. She never called him. She, she didn't want to work this out. She was, she was pretty much done with the marriage. She also said that her attorney advised her not to file a missing persons, um, as well as to file a restraining order 
And when asked if there were any any guns or weapons in the house, she said to her knowledge, no, there wasn't. Meanwhile, on the 5th of May, 2004, at the Chesapeake Bay uh, Beach and Tunnel, there was a couple of fishermen who also had their younger sons with them uh, fishing that day. And they had noticed a suitcase floating by. And the boys got really excited thinking, oh, we're going to find, you know, some sort of treasure. And so they ended up pulling the suitcase uh, up into their, their boat and opened it up. And they saw all of this like black um, plastic bags. And one of the little boys was so excited that he ripped open the, the plastic and there, there were actually human legs in in the suitcase and so after the shock of it all they did end up going to the police and then on the 11th of may another suitcase was found uh, by a student that was at fisherman's island and here the um torso and the head was found now they also noticed that there that um this victim had been shot and the bullets that were found were kind of different. They're wad cutter bullets. And I guess these are used for target practice. And so they did uh, be able to retrieve one from the head and three from the chest. And then on the 16th of May, the final suitcase was discovered. And this again was found in the Chesapeake Bay by a fisherman. And in this suitcase, uh, was the pelvis of of the victim so this so this case definitely made national news as you can imagine and they searched you know the database for any missing persons but again he was never um never reported and so the police decided to get a sketch artist to draw the john doe and then uh, put it on the news and see if if anybody would come forward uh, recognizing this this person. This really did pay off because a couple, John and Sue Rice, were watching the news and they happened to be friends with with Bill and Melanie. And Sue really did think that that looks like like Bill. And just a few days earlier, Bill's sister, Cindy, was actually reaching out to John to see if he had heard from, from Bill because she hadn't talked to him and she was starting to get concerned. And she said that she did talk to Melanie. Melanie did tell her about their fight and everything else, but nobody had, had seen or talked to Bill for over a month. And so then John and Sue did go to the police. So once Bill was identified, then they did call Melanie down to the station and informed her about Bill. And she burst out crying. And the one thing that they really did find kind of suspicious was that she never asked, like, well, what happened to him? Why, why is he dead? And so she did you know, agreed to a, an interview with the police, but she did bring her divorce attorney as well as a, a criminal attorney with her. And one officer did say that, you know, he saw that Melanie was crying a lot, but there really weren't any tears. And then they had asked about what kind of luggage they, they own. And Melanie said that they have luggage, but it wasn't matching. And then the next day, she did say that, yes, in fact, they do have a matching uh, three-piece Kenneth Cole luggage set. And when they showed a picture of, of the suitcase, she was able to say that, yes, that, in fact, was theirs. And she described to them that Bill had a knack for really pissing people off. He had a gambling issue and maybe he just crossed the wrong, the wrong person. She also did ask um, it, where they found his car. And at that point, they didn't even, you know, they, they didn't know. And so she had suggested 
you know, check out Atlantic City because because that's probably where he was. They did start searching the townhouse and initially they discovered that Melanie had already given away all of Bill's things. And so she had given his things to a friend of a friend. And so when they were able to then track this friend down, they were, they did see that all of Bill's stuff was still all in these big black plastic bags. Um, the guy hadn't even pulled them out yet. So that kind of made the police squint a little bit as well. As soon as they handed over Bill's body to Melanie, she she had him cremated. And Virginia handed over the case to New Jersey because they believed that the murder happened in New Jersey. There was still no physical evidence found, but there was enough circumstantial evidence that they were able to secure a a, a warrant and listen in on Melanie's phones. That's where the police then discovered Melanie's affair. And so they did bring in Dr. Miller. And of course, initially they suspected, you know, he could possibly even be involved, but he assured them that he wasn't. And he agreed to talk with Melanie, uh, knowing that the police were listening and he did ask her about, you know, Bill and, you know, if she was involved in that sort of thing. And she always said no. There was another man that uh, Melanie had been talking to, and his name was Jim Finn. And he, he always had a thing for Melanie. Um, I guess they were in school together. And so she was talking to him, and they talked about guns and getting a gun. Again, the police were kind of like, okay, you know, are thinking, is he involved or whatever? He also agreed to let them listen in on, on these phone conversations. And Jim was even kind of taken back and surprised that Melanie, in fact, did go ahead and get a gun on her own. And so the police pretty much, you know, crossed him off the list as well as, as far as suspects. They did check in New Jersey for any gun purchases and they didn't find anything to match up with Melanie. And so then they did check Pennsylvania and Pennsylvania had looser uh, restrictions, that sort of thing. And so they did end up finding that she purchased a gun as well as those wad cutter bullets two days before Bill went missing. She said that Bill was the one who wanted her to get a gun, but why would she have to then go to Pennsylvania to get it? So again, you know, the police are kind of squinting at her. They were also able to track her, um, where she went by her easy pass. And they did see that two days after the fight that Melanie did go to Atlantic City. And her explanation for that was that she wanted to go there and find his car and then move it you know, kind of like messing with them. And so she did, she moved it to the Flamingo Motel and she obviously had somebody else with her because while she was moving Bill's car, somebody else was moving her car. But unfortunately the camera footage was just, you know, not of good quality. So they couldn't really see see who was driving or anything like that. They did at one point suspect her stepfather and he was cooperative with the police, but that there were just these really kind of suspicious conversations him and Melanie had that the police were listening in on. So they, they did kind of suspect him for a while. They also saw that she went to Delaware five days after Bill went missing. And she had told Bill that she was gonna go furniture shopping um, bright and early in the morning. And she was doing this so that she didn't have to pay sales tax. And another thing about 
this little trip here is it's the same route to the Chesapeake Bay Bridge and Tunnel. So that is when they think she she actually tossed Bill over uh, into the Chesapeake Bay. Now, Bill went missing on April 28th or 29th of 2004. Melanie actually stayed in a hotel from April 29th until May 1st. And so you just kind of have to wonder why, you know, what you're saying Bill took off. Why would you then have to go and stay in a hotel room? So they speculate that Bill was in fact still in the townhouse. And so during the day she would, you know, take her, her kids to school and, and then go back to the townhouse and work on packaging Bill up, you know, in, into the suitcases. And then she would pick the kids up and go, go stay in the hotel so that they would be away from everything that's going on in the, in the townhouse. And so remember, she went to Delaware five days after Bill had gone missing. So this took her some time and she was the only suspect, but there was no physical evidence. Uh, they tore that townhouse apart looking, looking for evidence and they couldn't find anything. But there was just a lot of circumstantial evidence. So on June 2nd, 2005, Melanie was then arrested for Bill's murder. She was able to post the $750,000 bail and she pleaded not guilty. And on the 5th of March, 2007 was when, when um, her trial began. Joe Takapina was her attorney and their defense was that Bill, you know, is a gambler and he must have just crossed the path of the wrong person. They did discover searches on Bill and Melanie's computer, uh, searches like how to, how to purchase a gun illegally, how to commit a murder, undetectable poisons, uh, which then leads us to they did find in Bill's car a bottle of chloral hydrate. And what this does is it, it knocks you out. And they were able to track down the pharmacy, uh, which was very, very close to the kids' school. And they also were able to track down that the prescription came from Dr. Bradley Miller's prescription pad, which Melanie had access to. And when Brad testified, he not only testified that that wasn't his signature, but that the signature actually did look like Melanie's handwriting. Now, Bradley was the star witness and he did admit to the affair. He did admit that he, you know, he was in love with her and he, he did want to end up together with her. He didn't know anything about her buying a gun or her going to Atlantic City to to you know look for Bill's car or anything like that. And he did also admit to having conversations with Melanie uh, while the police were listening um, during the time that they were still actually involved. The gun that uh, Melanie had purchased was never found, but they were able to prove that the bullets did come from that gun. And they also did find these green fibers. And Bill's sister, Cindy, did testify that the McGuire's Bill and, and Melanie did have these green uh, throw pillows in, in their house. So it is speculated that Melanie had drugged Bill with a um, chloral hydrate in his wine, and then she shot him um, using the, the pillow, the green pillow to muffle the sound. The hospital blanket that wrapped Bill's head, it, they also were able to verify that the, that um, type of blanket 
was the same type of blankets that they had where Melanie worked. Pieces of, of Bill's flesh were also located and due to this case, they actually started calling this human sawdust. So it's skin particles that are a little bit bigger than say just normal shedding that we do. So Melanie burst into tears when the verdict was read that she was found guilty and she was sentenced to life plus five years. There were efforts made in, to try to appeal this and poke holes in some of the evidence that that was presented. There was a an issue with the number of grooves that were made, you know, from the gun and the bullet and come to find out the actual website hadn't been updated. So that didn't work out for them. And then the garbage bags that were found in the suitcases um, were tested against the um, plastic bags that were found in the townhouse. And tests were, were done to match these but not all tests were done. And so they tried to use that as well. And again, that didn't work either. And then the final thing that they tried to use was that animal hair was found in, in the suitcase and, you know, with Bill. But, and they were also not able to link animal hair with, with Melanie. But there was just so much more uh, evidence that that was against her. So she she currently is still uh, serving her her life sentence. Well, so. I hope you enjoyed you know this video. Please give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe. That really will help my my channel. And I hope you have a great day. Bye.